welcome to the third hearing uh, of the State Standing Committee on State Development Inquiry into the Feasibility of Undergrounding the Transmission Infrastructure for Renewable Energy Projects. I acknowledge the Anawan people, the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are meeting today. I pay my respects to Elders past and present and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people joining us here today. Today we'll be hearing from a number of stakeholders. I thank everyone for making the time to give evidence to this important inquiry. Before we commence, I would like to make some brief comments about the procedures for today's hearing. Today's hearing is being broadcast live via the Parliament's website. A transcript of today's hearing will be placed on the committee's website when it becomes available. In accordance with the broadcasting guidelines, the House has authorised the filming, broadcasting and photography of committee proceedings by representatives of media organisations from any position in the room and by any member of the public from any position in the audience. Any person filming or photographing proceedings must take responsibility for the proper use of that material. This is detailed in the broadcasting resolution, a copy of which is available from the Secretariat. While parliamentary privilege applies to witnesses giving evidence today, it does not apply to what witnesses say outside of their evidence at this hearing. I therefore urge witnesses to be careful about comments you may make uh, to the media or others after you complete your evidence. Committee hearings are not intended to provide a forum for people to make adverse reflections about others under the protection of parliamentary privilege. In that regard, it is important that witnesses focus on the issues raised by the inquiry terms of reference and avoid naming individuals unnecessarily. All witnesses have a right to procedural fairness according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the House in 2018. If witnesses are unable to answer a question today and want more time to respond, they can take a question on notice. Written answers to question on notice are to be provided within seven days. If witnesses wish to hand up documents, they should do, throw, do so through the committee staff. In terms of the audibility of the hearing today, I remind both committee members and witnesses to speak into the microphone. As we have members attending via video conference, it may be helpful to identify who questions are directed to and who is speaking. Finally, could everyone please turn their mobile phones to silent for the duration of the hearing. I now welcome our first witnesses. Could each witness, starting from my left, please state their name and position title and swear either an oath or affirmation. Uh, Grant Piper, a uh, farmer from the Kula District, Central West Res, Arana Res, and I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mark Fogarty, um, Director of Bushricity and Advisor to Red for New England. Um, I'll take an oath, I swear the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. Uh, John Pete Fell, Deputy Chairman, Red for New England. Uh, I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. Would either, any of you like to start by making a short statement? Please keep it to no more than a couple of minutes. Thank you. Um, I thank members of the Standing Committee for coming to Armbell to speak with us. You're the first uh, government uh, representatives who've, who have come to see us. Um, Red for New England stands for Responsible Energy Development for New England. It's a community alliance representing 12 community groups from Nunnall in the south to Ben Lomond in the north. The impact of overhead transmission lines cannot be segregated from the holistic picture for New England of cumulative impact. New England has been allocated 8 gigawatts of transmitted energy, which means about 15 gigawatts of wind, solar, battery, pumped hydro and associated transmission lines, hubs and substations. This is significantly greater than any other red zone. The mix we understand is 65% wind, 30% solar. This translates to around 1,500 wind towers and roughly 9,000 hectares of solar panels 
plus overhead transmission lines and five hubs. Approximately 900 of these towers and much of the transmission lines are in a 50 kilometre radius of Urala, which is incredible density, all on productive agricultural land. There has not been a proper cumulative impact study done uh, for the New England Res Zone, and th which is what we require. And the terms of reference should be environmental, particularly for land clearing and its consequences, agriculture, resources, traffic, remembering that all infrastructure has to come by the New England Highway from Newcastle, social impact, visual impact, rental affordability, waste management and landfill, indigenous cultural landscape, noise, compliance with wind and solar guidelines and social license. This, we believe, should have been done before the designation of the res. Take resources, for example. For wind towers alone, 1,500 wind towers, there is a requirement of some 1.6 million tonnes of sand, cement, aggregate, aggregate and reinforced and steel, and 135 million litres of water. We simply haven't got these resources. And for traffic, for the New England Highway, which is the only artery, for wind towers alone, excluding all the other infrastructure, there we estimate 18,000 oversized overmass vehicle movements, 1.1 million B double movements, 380,000 semi trailer movements, and 1.85 million light vehicle movements. This, we believe, will gridlock the New England Highway and the Oxley Highways and damage the, uh, the, the by roads for the environment. We have overwhelming amounts of land clearing and its consequences proposed for overhead transmission lines and the rest of the infrastructure. The <coughs> corridors proposed cross known koala habitats, particularly in the local area, with the, in the Malala and the Buralong area. We have a very delicate eucalypt environment on the western side of the highway and remnant vegetation only on the eastern side over which transmission lines cross. We need a, firstly we need a proper cumulative impact study for the whole of New England with the above terms of reference and we believe a reduction in the impact, a reduction in the allocation for New England to some three gigawatts which we believe we may be able to handle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd probably just like to back up a bit what John has, has covered. Um, we're obviously not um, energy economists. Um, we don't bring to the table in-depth knowledge of RET and, and all of the other um, um, methodologies that are deployed in considering its major infrastructure. We don't come with the same clarity as AER in terms of uh, looking at the regulatory. But what, what, what I think is very useful um, is the opportunity, and I think John started that, is just to put in context what the situation is up here. And, and I think in doing so, just reflect on where the community sit in relation to, um, I guess, um, the rollout. Um, we would back up, I think, um, having had, I didn't have the benefit of looking at the transcript from Tumut, but looking at the transcript from Macquarie Street, we certainly back up um, many of the, I guess, um, explanations given by uh, Andrea Strong and, uh, and also Ted Woodley and, and, uh, and I guess Jim Cox from the regulatory side, so we, we acknowledge that expertise. Um, we're five years into it, this decentralisation. Um, as John has introduced, Red 4 is, is certainly not opposed to decarbonisation. We've got our protocols attached. Um, but but it's, it's not what our message really today to the committee is it's not working. Um, the transition has got very much bogged down and that's pretty evident when we read the media and I guess very much why you're here and why um, Andrew Dwyer is going to exercise 
his inquiry um, going forward. The problem, I think, is, is very much one about speed skating. So I think that what we're all looking at now as this energy transition goes forward is all haste that was taken by the then uh, the, the previous state government in, uh, in rolling out the, the, the res zones, in rolling out the whole transition. And what broke down, I think, what let them down was clearly governance. And, and that was in two ways. I think certainly institutional governance in terms of the establishment of, of ENCO was a very quick um, energy co company was a very quick decision that was made and it was primarily um, housed with or sorry resourced with people straight out of the planning so what we did is we took one I guess bureaucratic psychology and put it into ENCO and that's then I think resulted in a lot of what's been happening because planning people tend to run very much based on the old wind wars that occurred back in 2014 um, down in the Southern Highlands and, and around that era was a thing called the DAD principle which was decide, announce and then defend. So ultimately that's what becomes the principle by which they, they deal with, with planning rollout. The Planning Act itself has been around since 79, started by Bob Carr in the, in the RAND government and it's just been added to. So it's basically a sh an old beach shack with lots of little rooms and things that are added, lots of ICEPs, lots of things like that, but it just not, doesn't not fit for purpose and constantly what happens is that it's a development act, it's not a planning act. And it's, John alluded to, and I do reflect on Andrew Dwyer in the transcript from Sydney, where he talked about the, the fact that we had a lack of top-down planning, and we'd say top-down, bottom-up planning was really what was necessary. So nobody looked at place and people. Even the ISP that was put out by AEMO, that was obviously 2018, 2020, 2022, well, quite evident in, in that was was the fact that AUMO was handing over to the state government the responsibility for people in place, and that just hasn't happened. Um, so we've got governance breakdown, um, and I think what 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 that does, and I, I'll just quickly summarise that is. Um, we still don't have the right technology platform, so solar and wind on its own is not going to be the answer. Um, we don't have, um, when we think about um, the rollout, we don't have sufficient transparency, so we're constantly trying to get answers from ENCO. It, it, it reads to me to a similar frustration that occurred between HumeLink and, and also Transgrid. So simple things like what is social licence, they can't tell us. What is the assumptions that underline the 32 gigawatts that have been uh, expressions of interest that have been put up? So without that transparency, which is obviously good governance, then communities will continue to push back. So we're not playing on a level playing field. So I, I think I'm not going to go into our response to the, the, the terms of reference. Um, we're totally in support of, of, um, of, of undergrounding the proposition. But the point I, I guess I'm labouring a little bit is the reason the communities are pushing back on transmission is because of their exper bad experiences in the planning cycle. And what worries us a little bit is above grounding is that we're just going to get another tsunami of, of projects, development, popping up, attaching to, to, to hubs, and, and the process will just continue on, as John just described, un without control and without, without the proper inquiry. So, um, Chair and Committee, that's just some opening comments. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, again for travelling up, everybody, and seeing us. Um, I've made a written submission on behalf of your Arby Tungy Lane Alliance, uh, and I've read a few of the other submissions, and they're all very good in the technical nature. And uh, like Mark, I don't want to focus on what I've written so much um, as a couple of case studies regarding undergrounding where it may be useful. Um, I represent the Uabri Tungy Lane Alliance, which is a small group outside of Kula. Uh, Kula is a small town being surrounded by 370, 250 metre turbines. Um, one of those projects has been in train for many years, the other one's relatively recent, and then obviously we have the associated uh, transmission, which uh, began with a transgrid proposal through some prime Merawar Catalyst Plateau, which we managed to defeat um, with the Merawar Catalyst Alliance, and then that more uh, moved into Energy Co got stood up then, once transgrid were sidelined. And 
again, like what Mark said, Energy Co seems to be um, is ill-equipped to do what they've been asked to do, and the experience of dealing with them is quite frustrating. Uh, the Central West Arana Res is the lead res, and, and there's many individuals and community groups uh, fighting individual battles with proponents and Energy Co. Um, we're trying to support, uh, set up a whole of res group to support each other and better organise. Um, but the main thing I want to spend my time on is we could, uh, the maps I handed to Stephen earlier, if you could, are they available, please? There's three case studies where undergrounding would be a direct benefit, and I think you can see that. And these are just near neighbours of ours, and they're not complete. I mean, there's many people affected, but these are three fundamental ones. Sorry, we just get the so I'll start reading well, anyway. Yeah, yeah. They're poorly marked up there, but map one, one top left-hand corner. Yep. Uh, yep, got it. You got that one. <laughs> so th this is the Haynes family, generational farming family, 3,000 odd acres on the Uabri Plain. Um, the house domestic area, as you see, is circled in pink in the centre inside the green circle and further inside the pink and the pink power lines surrounding them. Now, Ian's got a pacemaker. His, uh, his doctor's told him he's not, you know, not meant to go within 600 metres of power lines. So it's effectively house arrest. The, the lines go further across their farming country, and so just normal spraying, sowing, uh, checking stock or fixing fences, he's going to be severely constrained about where he can move about his own property. Um, there's alternative routes around this district uh, that would be opened up through undergrounding and or, or moving the, the above ground lines. Um, but they, Energy Co seems to avoid some landowners everywhere and then pile on to other landowners. The second map is uh, label number two. And this is the Armstrongs. Uh, it's a dual circuit 330 line that comes out of the Liverpool Range Wind Farm, farm South and then turns west to the Marlborough Hub. And the two pink circles just uh, below where 330 are their houses. So it goes right through their domestic area. And again, why it has to do that. But uh, Energy Co have been quite difficult, unresponsive really, to reasonable requests in that case. The nearest house is only 85 metres from the, the corridor centre line and the second house is about 300 odd metres. The, the third map, the hand drawn one there, is another gentleman, John Gormley, 700 acres. Uh, and this is the, the 500 kilovolt main trunk line. It's a duplicate 500 kilovolt line from the Wallar substation that uh, runs north and then west of the Marothery hub. So the easement is 250 metres wide, and I've outlined his property in the green. So it, it divides his property. It's going to severely affect what he does there. Um, to the west and to the uh, south are both host landowners of turbines or solar. <laughs> but the power line goes through a non-host's land and effectively wrecks the 700 acres. So those are the sorts of things that we, we scratch our heads about. And, um, and this property was bought a couple of decades ago as a retirement sort of superannuation property. John's retired. Um, and, and the damage to the value, how would you like your super knocked by 40 or 50%? No one should have to accept that. So there is the sample. Um, I think equity demands that undergrounding should be used where possible. As, as it is in the cities and within renewable host project boundaries. Um, we think because, you know, since en uh, Transgrid were sidelined, Energy Co is being used as a Trojan horse to push through using statutory authority powers to compulsory acquire easements. And uh, being a, a government agency, uh, we can't argue on the case of them being a private profit driven venture. Um, but then they're going to contract out all the construction, like this trunk group, 500 KVA, I think has already been shortlisted to a Spanish construction company, and then it'll be leased out for 25 years to someone to, to make profits off after it's been ran through by Energy Co. 
Now, the delays and frustrations of, of dealing with the power lines and Energy Co, uh, I'm proud to say has been caused by a lot of thinking, passionate people, and it's disappointing to see all that energy wasted. Um, when, if we could get everyone working together on sensible and practical solutions, or better yet, you know, developing their businesses and the state, rather than fighting these rearguard actions all the time, um, that we could really achieve something, but we spend all our time fighting stuff like this that we shouldn't even have to think about. So um, I'll close with a quote from the written submission. Um, we should not rush, uh, rush to commit energy suicide, um, but we really need to engage with the people and, and, and make good decisions for the longer term. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move to questions. So first hand over to the opposition for questions. Thank you. And I've got about seven minutes, is that? Seven, yep. yep. Thank you. Um, I've only got seven minutes, so I'm going to ask really quick fire questions. Um, so the first question I've got is um, around consultation. Um, obviously, uh, there's uh, routes that have been put out for consultation now. Um, can you describe the consultation process by Energy Co? Um, I want to see how it compares to what we've heard around the consultation from companies like Transgrid on Humlink. I'll ask Mr. Um, uh, Piper first, and then I'll come back to him. First thing we got was a letter in the mail in November, December 21, I think, from Energy Co. Um, but again, in the middle of harvest. And the routes we weren't sure of, and to highlight that at the moment, there's still, there's, we're, we're affected by a power line over the back of one of our properties. And there's still three routes in, in play in that corner. There's the, the scoping report route, which is on the website. Yep. There's the interactive map on the website, which is different in that location. And then the third one is the one they've sent us a, a letter of, uh, you know, so which route are we talking about? So so just because I've only got a very short amount of time, so you've received a letter. Um, have, have you been uh, involved in consultation? Have you had the opportunity to provide feedback um, about the potential impacts to you? And if so, what has been um, the response to that? Um, verbally, it's sort of accommodating. Um, officially on paper, nothing has been resolved yet. OK. Um, could I ask uh, the other um, two witnesses? I'll just quickly comment um, and just expand a little bit what I was saying before. Um, the, the stylist that decided to announce defend, that is the old planning um, um, process. I mean, a, a clear example of absolute frustration is in their legislation is the word social licence. And social licence tends to drip off everyone's tongue um, in government, but it doesn't mean anything and they can't tell us what it means and they have to apply it in a merit sense. Uh, firstly, I received a letter as one of the lines goes over the line and happens to go over my absolute centre of my driveway and my cattle yards and beach house site. Uh, consultation from um, Energy Co. was, as Mark said, uh, meetings where they've told us what's happening and talked to us and have not listened. At our instigation, we had a meeting with them and we had a good hearing, but absolutely no give at all or, 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 or response. So have you been clear as to what your objections are around those impacts to your mm. properties? And have you <coughs> provided um, solutions to that, i.e. have you made suggestions around undergrounding? And if you have, what has been the response to those alternate suggestions? Well, our, uh, as read for New England, our overwhelming responsibility to, to the communities that are, that are so distressed has been to address the cumulative impact issues and the issues with the community. The, the transmission lines have been incidental and cumulative to that uh, issue. Um, I note that uh, they have spoken about the fact that there will be information sessions that um, have been, I think, running from June to July um, recently around this area. Have uh, any of you had the opportunity to attend those information sessions? Um, what has been the um, style of that information session? Has it been uh, effectively just presenting information as, as a, a, you know, a fait accompli, or is it more about um, uh, seeking uh, feedback from people that would attend? 
Yeah, we've attended several consultation sessions and yeah, it's more just they stand up and present, but there's no tangible negotiation. You can't, I mean, individually dealing with the land acquisition manager, we try and communicate what we would, what we think, mm. but that doesn't seem to make, reach the higher levels or to result in a change or even clarification. As I said, they can't even clarify which route are they looking at. So, Because in, in May, I know yes. that uh, the Energy Minister has said that um, she's um, commencing consultation around the, the corridors for these transmission lines. Um, I'm wondering what um, that has uh, in, in effect uh, meant to affected landholders around what that consultation looks like. Are you being given the opportunity to um, object, provide uh, alternate solutions, or um, you know seek to engage on that on the, uh, the impacts that are going to be uh, enforced upon you if these routes are um, uh, determined to be the ones they will build on? Can I maybe just quickly answer that? Um, I think that the. the, the the, the, yes, there are some corridors and there are some options in, on, on the table, but what we're asking for is, okay, what are the assumptions underlying those options? Why is there a hub there? Why is there a hub here? Um, why is the, the, this an option? So what we want in a transparent way is tell us what your assumptions are because we know better than they do that some of these projects are just not going to happen. So all of a sudden you've got everyone getting a little bit excited about these hubs. These projects may never get out of the planning process. So it sounds to me as if um, the consultation process hasn't um, been uh, as robust as you might have hoped. Um, what would you hope would be an outcome from this inquiry in relation to uh, consultation about the routes that will impact your land? Do you want to have the opportunity to um, advocate more strongly for undergrounding? Um, do you want to have the opportunity to uh, try and discuss where those routes are actually positioned? What, what is it that you would like to see out of this? Well, we, we want a, a, a proper independent cumulative impact study for the whole of the res zone, including uh, the routes of the transmission lines, the capacity and, and undergrounding. Okay. You, you can't dissociate one from the other. Okay. Yeah, it is a total thing. I mean, we haven't suggested undergrounding because prior to this inquiry, I honestly hadn't looked at it very closely either. But it certainly, I think, has application mm. and would would be a benefit. But then the bigger picture is certainly one that needs considering. If we're just looking here, but. Mm. And, and um, well, this your time's pretty much gone. I'm sorry. just going to ask yeah. one last question. Just in relation Five to the, the member that had the pacemaker, and you may not may not know this, do you know that if um, if it's an underground line, would it have the same impact on a pacemaker, given that it's mo if it's underground, it would most likely be a DC system as opposed to an AC system? I imagine it would have I, the same I, impact. Look, there's probably, you've probably heard from more technical people, but from my limited reading on it, it seems to have, especially DC, virtually no, or it's, yeah, which is a lot much better sit, um, shielded than overhead lines. So it, I, I gather in that case it, it should may not impact yet, the same not, person. Okay, no, no, thank yeah. you. I'll hand over to the Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, thanks for uh, appearing today. Um, I, I have also had a question about the uh, pacemaker um, uh, situation. So that was the energy company that provided official advice, was it, to the no, landholder? No, that was his doctor. Right. Yes. Okay. So, and has uh, that, do you know whether it, you've heard uh, that being a standard kind of advice for, for, for people living. It's the first time it's, it's, it's come before this inquiry. It's very important information. Mm -hmm. And we have had an expert uh, provide evidence about um, EMF as well in yeah. terms of uh, what that means for uh, livestock potentially and humans. Yeah, no, I, I don't know. I haven't. Okay. Um, I just heard it from the family a couple of times. I've repeated it, but that is what okay. the Okay. Nothing said. from the energy companies themselves in this regard? No, there's no data or standards, if you like, yeah. I'm, I'm aware of. Mm. That's gonna, do you find that concerning? It is, and I won't say they're dismissive about it because you can obviously see the lines skirt his house um, fairly clearly, uh, but there's that one. Um, <coughs> but they, they're sort of dismissive to them about there being any problem about moving about his property or anything. They've skirted his house, so he's got a, you know, he's on a short leash, but that seems okay. 
Um, to your maps that you've provided, uh, the map two, which has that kind of strange uh, kind of bend that you're saying, uh, you've got the, the marks of the two dwellings there, residential dwellings. Um, what has the energy company uh, provided as the reason as to which they're doing that? And what has, there been res what has been their response to requests to have it further away from the house, which I'm assuming uh, has been made? Uh, well, the owner of the property is actually here, but I believe it's, there's terrain considerations. Uh, terrain. There's also, uh, terrain? Oh, terrain. Terrain. Sorry, a bit dry. Um, and there's also a travelling stock route reserve that they don't want to transit. Um, and, and this is one of the link 330 lines that goes into one area of the Liverpool Range wind farm. And there's a property... Yeah, I don't know. And on the other side is a, is a state forest on the other side of the Golden Highway. Just below the end, that curve is the Golden Highway running from Newcastle to Dubbo. So I'm not sure what the other land constraints are. Um, but this is just following what was the original tilt route that tilt was negotiating out of their wind farm to Eulen. And Energy Co has just picked up their route that they had already started okay. negotiating. Okay, um, I wanted to ask a question um, of all of you about bushfire risk as a result of uh, transmission, uh, overhead transmission lines. This committee has heard quite a bit, um, including yesterday uh, in uh, Tumut. Uh, is that a concern? Uh, has it been raised in, in meetings and what's the response been? I suppose it's a multi-pronged question. Yes, very much so, and particularly as the the route of the proposed new 500 kV line, uh, certainly in New England, running from particularly, well, from Bendemeer to Black Mountain, tra traverses uh, land that has regular fires every summer due, due to lightning strikes. Uh, anyway, uh, the much publicised um, uh, fires created, we understand, by tra uh, transmission lines is very much um, to the fore, uh, but also the ability to fight the regular fires that occur anyway due to the in inability of uh, helicopter and fixed wing um, access, uh, particularly with the turbines and now um, uh, added to by the overhead transmission lines. Well, I think the evidence that um Ted Woodley and, and Andrea gave on Thursday, and I don't know about yesterday, but I think we're fairly spot on in terms of their interpretation of, of the risk. And you, you, you appreciate um, flying up here, the, the proximity to the Oxley Wild Rivers National Park, the Gondwana, and, and the, the wilderness areas that are very pristine here. And the, these are a major concern as to how they will, I mean, but the, the tool of trade now is, is aerial bombardment. and. So it becomes when you've got wind turbines in and you've got overhead transmission, then it's almost a no-go zone, particularly on the western side of the, high, of the New England Highway. So we accept the, the evidence that you know Black Saturday wasn't all about transmission, but it was certainly one of the causations. So it will be a major concern. And I do notice that some, at 12 o'clock you've got um, Jason McKellen right. here to talk about that one. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's a big issue for us. Thank you. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, just about compensation as well. So that uh, issue has uh, come up, uh, of course, um, with multiple witnesses. Um, I'm aware that this will cross over a little bit into uh, in relation to renewable energy projects more broadly, uh, but the compensation, uh, it seems very unfair, we've heard, about the compensation uh, for, uh, that is less for landholders that have transmission lines as opposed to renewable energy projects. Is that uh, correct uh, in this part? Has that been raised? I think that is correct assumption. Um and um, yeah, so you, you're really looking at around about 30k per turbine here in, the, in this area as the going price. And um, transmission, obviously, one off payment and an easement payment um, annualised will be far less than that. I do know that the government last week talks now about access and access fee payable and things like that. So, look, I, I just think it's going to be. Um, 
uh, you know, it, it's certainly inequitable in that sense. And, and the big issue, of course, with the undergrounding or, or, or overgrounding is, is the devaluation of property. Um, Grant, I think, highlighted with his practical case study there. So it's, it is very un inequitable. Um, with, the, with this inquiry, obviously, we're focusing on under, underground tran transmission, not renewable energy projects per se. So, um, but what would be some of the recommendations that you would like this inquiry, this committee, to come up with to government. Um, I'm aware that the, uh, your uh, organisation, the um, Renewable Energy for New England, um, uh, has made a lot of recommendations or concer expressed concerns about the planning uh, system more broadly and could probably make I, I a lot of recommendations in that point, regard. Really, the key to this whole thing, which should have happened in the first place, and instead of the speed skating that happened coming out of the then Minister for Energy's office, we should have done some spatial planning. That's what the ISP asked for. AEMO actually said to the state governments in 2018, you need to go back on the ground and get an understanding of what goes where and why, what are the socio-economic issues. So without this independent cumulative impact statement, we can't do a lot. The second thing I think we really need is, is for, I think, for the government to put a microscope over ENCO and find out, is that the right institutional model? We don't think it is, as it currently sits. And certainly the, the planning governance is, is completely out of whack and inequitable and produces um, injustice for communities as it currently sits. It's, it's like a game of snakes and ladders without snakes. The developers just keep going up tick in the box and, and it's not it's not what it's supposed to be and so I, we would I think you know a review of governance a review of the institutional frameworks and certainly most clearly at the front end a, a complete transparency on an independent cumulative impact mm, thank you we might so, move to um to government questions now sorry Kate. Yes. um Thank you for your submissions and for coming today. Um, I just wanted to ask you a quick, uh, couple of questions about the consultation process so far, um, and if you could just, you know, in, in your experience, recount um, what that's been like and um, any any suggested um, improvements or otherwise. Um, well, uh, to reiterate, I guess we've got the um, initial letters, and initially there were letters from Transgrid, but then the energy group on which wasn't very specific. Uh, and then there were consultation meetings in Cooler and Dunedoo, which I attended, um, on was host, a couple of hosts by New South Wales farmers. But again, it was just a, a broad brush description. It didn't have specific details of where. We didn't just talk about roots. I mean, they only talked roots with individual landholders. They never presented roots with the, the, the group meetings, with the, the town meetings. Um, when we did try and tie them down, you, you, you got blocked or, or, or shut down. I mean, we did, um, you know, we're, many of the, uh, but this was the whole renewables, not just the power lines, you know, many of us were getting quite upset with being stonewalled and not getting any answers, especially when you've asked these questions. The route that was decided or, or as it changes, again, there's no background or justification for that. It's just, a, they, you know, you get the opening letter, like we did in May, you know, um, Maybe and, and the route is already on the map for the yep. compulsory ac or for acquisition. And then you have to start trying to negotiate from there. Um, I don't think, the, the, gen the consultation isn't genuine or the person you're talking with, I know they've got a lot of moving parts they're trying to juggle, but the person you're talking to isn't in a position to make a decision or isn't authorised to give you answers anyway. So you feel like there's not much point talking to them you need um, much higher level people to, I don't know, to find out who's making the decisions or, or how you can change things or influence the process. Um, I, I mean, if we could recommend undergrounding in many areas, I think it would solve many problems, but then the, the total picture of the cumulative Im impact and whether this is the right approach at all, it, it still needs to be considered at some level by some people and not left to us to sort of fight. Um, and then there needs to be limits on limits on, on on this. Like John says, everyone you build an overhead line, 
and then you, we see this happening where everyone will tap into it over the next 5, 10, 20 years. There's no, where, where is the end point on this? Are we going to be completely covered in panels and, and surrounded by turbines? Okay. What is the end point? If you give us a clarity that this is what we're going to do and it's going to stop here, there's not going to be any more projects and then they're assessed individually, assessed individually. Okay. There needs okay. to be a, a, a limit. Sorry. Sorry. <coughs> Can I put this into context in relation to our communities? We're five years into this, um, and, and the first wave, the, the, the first, the, the government policy was prosecuted firstly, initially, by agents for foreign developers. And these guys were coming in, signing up hosts and in, in, with gag clauses, and this created uh, and so the first most of us heard about it was rumour and, and pub talk. They're John, doing just to this clarify, thing. this is for the RES projects, for, re for yeah. renewable energy yeah. projects. Yes, yes. Thank yes. you. Sorry. So five years ago this started and it spread, these projects started to pop up without any g government consultation whatsoever. And then EISs were issued and, and communities started to, to, to fight back. We then, uh, we, we then had a wave of uh, ENCO consultation regarding those, regarding the res zones, where we were told what was going to happen. We didn't, have, we didn't appear to have any say. And, and this created tremendous community division. And it was no way to prosecute government policy because it, it was purely about the dollar for largely foreign investors. We then were told, and, and ENCO have, have really have given us good hearings at our instigation, but they haven't listened, they have not varied from their line. And, and then the third wave was the transmission lines. Again, no consultation. And it, it, it was, uh, as Wes said, alluded to, it was a fait accompli. And we're still at that position. Thankfully, if, People were the first to come and have a proper open hearing with us in five years. This is what we're about. Uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks, gentlemen, uh, for coming and talking to us. I wanted to firstly um, ask Mr. Piper, uh, in your your experience with these processes, uh, I'm interested in your response, I suppose, to some evidence that we heard yesterday. And it was to the effect that the community and community organisations are in a difficult position when the organisation with the most expertise in transmission is also the organisation that stands to benefit from the projects. And I was curious about your comment um, on whether it's been hard to deal with these issues um, and deal with the company in circumstances where I assume you don't have their expertise in transmission. Uh, well, no, I guess we don't, but I don't know, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to belittle Energy Co, but I'm not sure how much experience they have either, <laughs> really. Um, it's, they're not, I mean, you've been dealing with hearing from people who are dealing with Transgrid or Ausgrid or other people, so I, I would suspect they're a lot more expert than, than Energy Co is. Um, but, I mean, we have many skilled people and in our community as well. There's retired engineers, um, there's other professional people. We're not all uh, just farmers, so we can draw on a lot of expertise. And there are a lot of skills there. And um, we can, I mean, I'm not a power engineer, but I can read technical documents and pick up on things. And, and I understand the basics of you know, physics and engineering, so it's not that difficult to see when something is plainly silly or wrong or they cut across the corner of your property rather than just going straight into the state forest and turning right rather than zigzagging through your property and then turning right or why do you have to go between houses so i don't know whether we're at a disadvantage technically because we never get to a technical stage of discussion it's just sort of strong arm fate complete tactics it's not not about engineering it's about negotiation Thanks. Sir. Does that help? It does. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you all for attending this hearing today. Um, the committee members may have additional questions for you after the hearing. Uh, the committee has resolved the answers to these, along with any answers to questions taken on notice today, be returned within seven days. Uh, the Secretary will contact you in relation to any of these questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, we're a bit squashed in. <laughs> um, could each, each witness, uh, starting from my left, please state their name and position title and swear either an oath or information. Thank you. Um, John Gallatly, Councillor on the Armdale Regional Council, and I swear. I've it's there and it's done. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry, sorry, okay. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thanks. I'm Sam Copeland, Mayor of Armadale Regional Council. I'll be doing the affirmation. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I'm Daniel Boyce, I'm the Chief Officer of Planning and Activation at Armadale Regional Council. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. I'm Kate Jessup, the General Manager at Yorala Shire Council. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. I'm Eric Noakes, Mayor of Walker Council. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. I'm Tony Avery from Yorala Shire Council. I'm the Executive Director of Infrastructure and Development. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the whole truth, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you. And would any of you like to start by making a short statement, just noting that uh, if you could keep it to a couple of minutes because it will limit our time for questions. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to perhaps quickly position um, your Shire Council for the members of the committee and just make a few comments on part one and four of the uh, terms of reference. So just briefly on Urala Shire Council, we are a small rural community, some 6,000 res residents spread over a large geographical area of 3,226 kilometres square, positioned right in the centre of the New England re Renewable Energy Zone. Our community, natural environment and infrastructure are inevitably being affected by the res development and future operations. Uh, we have very limited resources. If I take out our age to community care proportion, which is a services that council do as, on, as a discretionary service, uh, just the core business, we're about 90 full-time equivalent with an annual budget of about 20 million. 
Um, we have a huge infrastructure responsibility across 923 kilometres of road, about half of which are unsealed. We lack the capacity and expertise to enable a comprehensive submission to this parliamentary inquiry, um, and we are awaiting some foreshadowed funding via Energy Co. I think it's going to be in the order of 250000 a year to help us have that capacity. As such, Council has not formed a resolved position on this matter. Um, what I'm going to cover today, I would anticipate it's largely on your list already, but we wanted to make sure some representation was here on behalf of the community. So this has been put together by officers only, uh, with Executive Director Tony Avery's import, our Civil Infrastructure Executive Manager, uh, Mr Fitzsimmons, our Interim Manager Planning and Development, That's Ms right. Kate Blackwood, and That's our you. Manager Environment and Waste, Dr Benjamin Kogo. Yeah. So just briefly on the costs. Um, again, I don't presume that the committee haven't already thought of all of these things, but just to touch on a few that have come to our mind. Um, we do think there may be a higher risk for future roadworks and construction and farming with undergrounding. Um, so, of course, at least with overhead, we know where they are. Um, we assume there will be considerations for really well signed and marked location of any underground lines. and excavation exclusion zones and making sure all those details get to not just the council but our farming community. Um, we are mindful that uh, high voltage overhead um, may have arcing issues in terms of vehicles working in and around uh, those areas and we assume that um, easement lines for overhead um, as well as underground can still be grazed um, but in terms of being able to actually do agriculture on top of underground uh, transmission lines would need to be considered. Um, and of course, we uh, anticipate if there is a higher, if there is a higher cost, we are not experts in this, um, with undergrounding that ultimately the taxpayer and consumer are funding that cost. On the benefit side, um, we would consider that potentially undergrounding will avoid that permanent disturbance to the landscape that occurs with the overhead lines and especially uh, our areas of high environmental conservation values and sensitivity, we would see a great benefit in undergrounding. Um, my next three points relate to the easements. Um, we are assuming that there would be narrower easements from undergrounding, um, which would be a significant benefit in terms of the amount of clearing that could lead to erosion, landscape instability and potential spread of weeds, which is already a big issue to be managed in the regions. Um, the obvious loss of but it will be less loss of native flora and threatened species if there are narrower easements and uh, less release of greenhouse gases from that loss of vegetation. Reducing and removing potential bushfires from resulting that could arise from fallen towers and associated infrastructure. Um, re re <coughs> possibly the reduction of locally quarried material requirements to construct overhead transmission lines. There's already incredible pressure on our local quarrying capacity just to build the res components themselves. Uh, the visual impacts, of course, I'm sure you have already considered. Um, and that uh, underground lines may be less susceptible to natural disasters. And the other final point on this that we think is very important is the reduced interaction with aircraft. This is really important for our agricultural areas. Routine aviation includes fertiliser, of, co fertilizer of course, aerial spraying, and often um, the reliance on firefighting capacity. Uh, just briefly on the environmental impacts, uh, many of which are considerations for either option. And again, I'm not presuming the panel and committee have not thought of these things. Um, there is, of course, the direct and indirect ecological effects, um, flora and fauna, to be considered. The potential impacts to waterways that can arise during construction and post-construction of these pro proposed um, transmission lines. The quantities of waste to be generated and the disposal options, considering the current very limited capacity of our waste management within the region. Uh, the potential impacts on existing above and below the ground infrastructure, of course the effects on human health in terms of exposure to electromagnetic and frequencies with high voltage transmission lines, the soil disturbance aspect, and the surface easements needed to quarantine and restrict land use. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is there any other statements? Eric, you can go. Yep. 
I said, I'm Eric Mapps, Mayor of Walker Council. Uh, Walker Council sits at the bottom end of the New England Renewable Energy Zone. It has a population of around 3,500 people over an area of nearly 6,500 square kilometres. Apparently we have our next one, Wind Reserve, and seem to, as we're the first one, the power lines will reach to be, uh, be the interest of a lot of uh, companies who wish to uh, go down the wind, um, the wind path. So the mandate of the New England Renew Renewable Energy Zone will have major impacts on the social, economic and visual amenities of the community of Walker. Sitting at the southern, e southern end of the res, it is envisaged that the routing of around 500 k of a 500 kV line through our local government area will lead to a concentration of a large number of renewable energy projects, creating a cumulative impact that will industrialise our landscape. Already, we have two of the largest wind farms in Australia being scoped or progressed through the Department of Planning that would encircle our town. The imposition of up to 30 kilometres of 80 metre high transmission towers, plus the associated smaller lines, has an impact on agriculture, health and our landscape. As a mayor who is passionate about his community, its social cohesion and ability to carry on business under underground and transmission lines would appear to be an excellent outcome. Obviously, tempering this from my minimal knowledge of, com of the complications of underground lines are the issue it raises, which may have impacts that match or outweigh our overhead lines. I won't cover the issues that Kate's already covered because th they apply to Walker well, too many of them, so there's not much use me going over them. But whatever the outcome, communities such as Walker will be changed forever. Their social cohesion, visual beauty and ability to carry out business are damaged. I believe we need to find a better way to engage communities early in these processes. The days of calling informing consultation need to be over. They are not consulting. We are being informed of what's happening. And I, I know this is late in the process, but we need to get better at that. And thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I... Is that on? Um, so yeah. That's the hand side, Mike. Yeah, you yeah. might want to use... Yeah, use that one. It's still important, but yes, use, <laughs> use your one. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I agree uh, with what you've heard from Urala and Walker. Um, to me, the biggest, one of the biggest barriers to the effectiveness of the res is going to be social licence. And uh, loss of social licence is going to come from two sources. There's going to be the actual developments and then the transmission lines. And this, this uh, inquiry is around transmission lines. What I'm hearing here in the Armidale LGA, and I'm sure it'll be uh, elsewhere, is that it's a sense of fairness. There are hosts that are hosting projects who don't have the burden of the transmission lines. And it's, the, it's these non-hosts that, that are carrying that burden. And so one of equity would suggest that if you are hosting a project, where possible, you should be hosting the transmission lines as well. So you can either shift transmission lines or put them underground. And that's going to be go, it won't solve your social licence issue, but it'll certainly go a long way towards it. Thank you. Now move to questions, if I can have it. Uh, thank you, position. and um, I appreciate uh, everyone uh, appearing today, and uh, especially your opening statements. I think each of them in in themselves was interesting. Um, Ms. Jessops, yours was a fantastic, um, uh, succinct way of describing a lot of the issues that we've been facing throughout this uh, inquiry. Council Noakes, um, your um, uh, Submission, sorry, your opening statement around the way that you talked about uh, the impacts uh, of your com on your community and as a way it's going to change forever is clearly something we've been hearing as a theme throughout this inquiry. And uh, Councillor um, Copeland, uh, the um, I think the way that you talked about equity was was and again another theme. I'm going to go to that one first uh, in the questioning. It seems to me that. There's uh, a lack of equity in particularly transmission lines because, one, um, there's, as you said, not the people that are hosting the projects are uh, lumbered with the transmission lines. The transmission lines are, in effect, there to move power from those projects to people in larger metropolitan areas um, because, obviously, that's where most of the power is needed. And we've heard uh, from the regulator that, in effect, um, the cheapest way of transmitting that power is the favoured one because, ultimately, it's the bills of 
the end user that will be impacted if we are to adopt a more um, uh, expensive option such as undergrounding um, and therefore they prefer the cheaper option. Do you have a view about what your community thinks um, is the impact of having something like, you know, 70 odd metre tall um, 500 kVA power lines or 330 kVA power lines imposed on them to provide cheaper power bills to city dwellers? It's probably a little bit of a loaded question, but... Oh, it is, absolutely is a loaded question. It's basically me throwing the ball up yeah, and letting you, you hit it. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, I, yes, it certainly does go, go to equity, uh, and this has been bandied around a lot. Why, does the, why do the regions have to take all of the burden for, for the, you know, the vast city population? Now, in terms of cost, Done properly, you'd be you wouldn't be amortising this over a 20-year period. Done properly, you'll be this will be a harbour bridge uh, mm. that's done 90 years now. Um, so spend the money, do it properly, and build build infrastructure the way infrastructure should be built, built to last, not with a not with planned obsolescence. And so amortise this over 100 years, and I think the impact on uh, on, on cost of power, sure. Uh, the transmission is one component of it, but it's not, not certainly not the largest component of the price that, that we pay at the end of the day. Um, Can I put a little bit down? In? Love you to. And, and furthering from what, what um, Council Captain said, I, I, we're not looking at, at a quick fix here, and as far as the electricity bills go for whoever it is, I, I believe that that doesn't come into it, as, as Sam has said. We do the job properly, we do it once, and, and, it, and, and then it can be recommissioned and recommissioned and recommissioned to suit whatever it is that, that, that is in the future. This isn't looking into the future, which is what we have at, as councillors and, and running, running towns that have to do. We're looking into the future, we're not worrying about about it just tomorrow. We're, we're worried about 20, 30, 40 years down. And if this is the, the, the big solution of our wind and our solar and our hydro, that is going to bring the price of power down by a significant lot, amount because of the, of, of the cost savings in the long term, I don't think this really comes into it as far as the Freddie Flintstone um, wires that the birds sit on, I, I think. And also, when you, when you look at the way that we have been going, just in, in, in any of your subdivisions, whether it's, whether it's industrial or housing or whatever, what is the preference to do? Underground. As yeah. to go underground. So I, I can't see why we're making a bigger footprint with all these, these new lines that are going through that is... It, I, I, think, I think we're barking up the wrong tree with trying to do it as a Band-Aid situation. Thank you. Could I um, invite some of the other witnesses to perhaps um, provide some uh, feedback about, um, I guess, that inequity of um, the, the, the rural regional areas bearing the brunt of these projects in order to provide cheaper bills to city dwellers, but also um, what opportunity you might have had to um, provide some feedback uh, on these plans and perhaps um, advocate for a different solution, i.e. undergrounding? Um, I guess from Malcolm's point of view, we're, it, we're really struggling because we're, we're looking at uh, the amount of wind towers coming into town too. This is only a thing that, that our, our community's known about for a, for a month or more. Um, and that's what comes back to you know, this, this part about uh, they're not consulting with us, they're, they're telling us what's going on. That, you know, we should have been involved in this discussion a long time ago. So <laughs> we have uh, people who are having wind towers really upset that they're having transmission lines through their place, which really sort of amazes me that, that they do that. But, but our community is, is an up, uh, up in arms over all of it. You know, the, um, the, the power lines coming through and, and it comes back to this whole aerial thing and, and all of that. So, yeah, our community, I don't say they're, they're researched because the, the um, engineering job of putting power lines underground is not something most of us understand, the risks, and, and they haven't even been put to us in a lot of ways. But uh, mm. it's certainly something that we would prefer not to see run through our community. But... Um, I guess, as I said, we haven't engaged the community really heavily because they're still trying to, to determine where, what's happening with wind towers. Maybe I'll rephrase the question just in a slightly different way then. Um, given that you haven't had the chance to perhaps advocate for a different solution, like undergrounding, because perhaps you haven't um, 
got the technical expertise to say what you might do. Have different solutions been presented to you and your community? Have, have, have they just said, you know, we, we want the, the project is to move power from one location to another? Here are some solutions. What does the community want in relation to this? Have they provided you any uh, and that comes opportunity? Back to my final comment and opening thing that this is um, informing, not engaging, or not um, consulting. All that we have seen is really maps. Yep. Um, you know, the, the maps of where they're going to run within a, a one kilometre um, uh, corridor. So, you know, if you're in that one kilometre corridor, yeah, they might be another 50 metres, 100 metres, 200 metres from your house, but it's still within that corridor. There has been no consultation. So, in that, um, with that in mind, I guess, um, there's a requirement that these projects are consulted with with the community. Could you um, give me your views as to how you feel the consultation around a lot of these projects has occurred of late and what you think could be done in a different way to have the community have more buy-in and, and have the, community, um, the community's views reflected in the final solutions that are put forward um, to, to have power transmitted in and out of the race? Um, I guess with, uh, with our initial wind project being 20 years in the, in the making and being hidden from the community for the first 15 years of that, it's the attitude of some of these uh, development companies that have got no intention of engaging the community because they know the reaction. And quite often the company that scopes it then sells it on to another company and it's their job then to write the EIS, and that's when the community becomes involved. Mm. And they're a bit like a line, everything just slips off them. They, you know, if they don't want to engage, you can't engage them. There is no way that you can engage a company. They'll, they'll get all their, um, their engagement people, and they'll come and visit you, and they'll shake your hand and do all these things. But, and it's the same in a way with Energy Co. As I said, this has been very late coming to us. The res was very late coming to us. It, it feels more like a box ticking exercise, is that fair? Oh, I think so. A lot of it is. A lot of it we are finding is just a box-ticking exercise. Can I ask, um, just in relation to approval of these um, projects or, you know, even transmission lines, etc., um, given that you're all representing, I guess, councils um, either, you know, uh, through councillors or, you know, through the, um, I guess, through the uh, head office type um, arrangements, how much um, engagement has occurred at the council level with these projects? How much uh, opportunity do you have to provide um, feedback on the plans and to have, um, I guess, some approval um, or, or n not approval um, uh, control over what's put forward? Uh, look, being uh, with, with the projects being state significant development, um, where council's been sidelined, it wasn't really until in the New England uh, that our, our five councils got together and laid out a statement of expectations, which is really geared towards the generators, as a set of ground rules on how we would like you to behave. Um, we've now increased that, that group, we call it the CoREM Group, Coalition of Renewable Energy Mayors, to bring in uh, the Central West Arana Res and the Hunter, members of the Hunter are joining us as well. And that has come about due to the I guess, sense of emasculation that the whole res has, has, has caused for us. Um, now, it's not until we've come together as a group that we have been able to have some input. I realise that your question was back to the individual developers. Um, as a result of the noise that we made, and a, a, a consistent approach, certainly within New England to start, now the developers are far more likely to engage with us. But we've had to, had to push that. We've had to spread that word throughout the community as well, certainly to host landholders. Um, if you're talking to someone, you better make sure they're coming to talk to us. Now, the level of our ability to shape an individual project, I think, has been somewhat limited, though. We'll now move to, um, to crossbench questions. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Chair. Uh, uh, had down word for word almost was very uh, strange. <laughs> so we'll continue on um, this. Uh, the, the guidelines, uh, Councillor Gov, <laughs> that you said had been developed, would we be able to, the committee, be able to receive those guidelines uh, firstly? And if you could, um, they're just guidelines. 
Uh, uh, it's a statement of expectations. Okay. So guidelines-ish. But this is if, if you are developing a project in our region, we this is how we expect you to behave. This is what we expect you to do. So we're talking about planning agreements there, biosecurity offsets, biodiversity offsets. Sorry. Um, What's been the Department of Planning at a state level? What's been their involvement in those guidelines, their willingness to assist there? Because uh, you would think that something like that would have been ideal at the beginning of the process around the, the, the very development um, of these uh, re renewable energy zones, bringing the community and agencies and local government together. Did anything happen like that at the beginning and what has been the Department of Planning's response and engagement? I think it would be fair to say that the reason that we had to put the group together was the, the vacuum of, of, of ideas there. Now it's not until this co-REN group, and I you know, hats off to my, my friend Councillor Noakes from, from Walga who really was the, the, the impetus for that, uh, it wasn't until we had that co-REN group together that we've been able to have meaningful engagement with the Department of Planning prior to that. It was, I think, scant at best. Um, now, as you'd probably aware, the wind guidelines are in the process of being updated. And my under, to the extent that I'm willing to share, um, I think a lot of what we have been able to put forward as a co rem group has been, is probably in the draft. Whether it's in the final remains to be seen. But. Um, Okay, uh, so that's going to be important. Sure, and others uh, jump in if you if you need to on these questions as well, please. So, is there any um, uh, mention or consideration of underground transmission in uh, anything that you've been doing, and have you been advocating uh, for that outside of today's forum? The short answer is no. Um, it, it it has it has to date been focused on the actual projects. Uh, not, not the transmission line. And I'd probably just like to clear up, when I was talking about the social friction, uh, that, that is a big thing. We are, and we're seeing it a lot in Walker at the moment, but that social dislocation of our communities is, is really, really important. So when I was talking about hosts versus non-hosts, I'm talking about the hosts of projects and the, you know they get a lot of financial upside. They should be wearing the social burden if power lines or transmission lines are going to be above ground, stick it on host land as best you can, underground it through non-host land. That will go a long way to ameliorating the friction. Can I sure. Put, put a quick of course. Here. I'll, just, just going back three or four years, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a why the, the, the community and everyone are very, very whip shy about anything that comes up in relation to the res. Well, it was really before the res was put together. We had um, the, the were, were opponents that were coming here and, and setting stuff up before the res. When, when the, the roadmap came out probably about two years ago for the res, um, the bird had already flown as far as any trust had gone mm. because they, it was very under the table stuff and you don't speak to your neighbour. And this, admittedly, with, with the, the transmission lines, this is just following in, in the, the, those people's minds, I believe, it's following the same thing. It's we'll just go in and do it and we know what's best. And that's why they're so, so whip shy about it now. And, and that's why it's going to be very, a, lot of, a lot harder for us to give them any confidence that they're doing the right thing and we're doing the right thing because there is no trust there. Thank you. Uh, can I also ask a question about the financial benefits that that will or may arise from uh, these renewable energy projects? Clearly, the uh, uh, landholders get uh, compensation um, that have uh, turbines and what have you. What about the councils? Thank you. Through the chair. Um, at this point in time, that is going to be whole, pretty wholly reliant on planning agreements. And that's what's in the, is very clear, number one item in the Coalition of Regional Energy Mayor's Statement of Expectations is the 1.5% on capital investment value as an annual payment. Um, however, we're yet to really lock that in and actually get any money to start flowing. 
Um, but on top of that, what we found is the proponents have wanted to have a lot of control and say over what they'll get for that. They're seeing that as marketing money and will keep, keep the community happy money. We see it as absolutely critical social licence money to fund much uh, uh, social um, com and community outcomes that we already do not have enough funding for. So our library services, our parks and gardens, our um, halls, all the things that actually generate community wellbeing, um, we, uh, as a tiny, very proud council who have fought very hard to maintain its independence, we are just getting squeezed from every direction. Um, we cannot make one plus one equal three. We need actual cash. And that goes to my very first point. We couldn't even put a submission into this because we do not have the capacity. Um, we can't ask our council to make an informed decision when we do not have the technical know-how, the hours in the day, to actually properly understand a matter and put it before. And our council has to be very mindful that they, this is not for them to be torn about part politically over. They represent the whole of the community. There are, benef there are people, that, community elements that are happy and are benefiting. There are those that are very unhappy. So it's a very difficult position that the council, the elected representatives of the whole of the community have been placed in at quite short notice. Before my time's up, I'm sorry, I, was just, I think you do want to jump in, but just to, uh, I do want to just uh, ask where that's up to in terms of that ask within state, within government, uh, what's the response been, what's the reception like and, and yeah, where's that up to in terms of consideration? If I could uh, j jump in on that. So it was certainly something that we lobbied for as, as a group of councils. Um, it's been endorsed, for want of a better term, by ENCO. They can understand now why that is happening. And I suspect the, um, the updated wind guidelines will have a component in there that's, that kind of matches where we're at. OK. So again, this is something that has happened because we as a community have fought for it. Um, it. It wasn't something that was offered. It, it was, yeah. So we're, we're probably there in terms of fi funding, uh, the, the community benefit funding that might flow from uh, Energy Corporation. You know, that's, that's very nebulous at the moment. We've been told, you know, effectively, don't you worry your pretty little heads, it'll, it'll happen. That's, I'm, I'm good for questions. Can Thank I just you. Make another comment on that. Sure. But Kate, I wanted to join you first. Um, and, and it comes to what Kate said about resourcing. You know, on, on top of this, we're trying to draw up um, our infrastructure agreements so that our roads aren't wrecked. And it's the same thing. We do not have the, the um, capacity to do that. And if we do that for a, we've got 80 k's of council road involved in the in the first project that's coming to Walker. We do not have the capacity to analyse those roads, see what the long term. Um, damage to them can be, and then the project may not go ahead. So it's, um, I think probably ENCO and the department are doing the best they can under the circumstances. They're very good at uh, talking to us, but we need, as, uh, as our GSM said, some really good stiff guidelines around this so that we don't have to be, be doing it. Thanks. Madam Chair, if I could also just add the other thinking with the CORIM is around actually being able to accrue a reasonable amount of money to do some genuine legacy projects such as virtual power networks or power sharing agreements for our community so we can, with this, actually grow jobs, grow the economy and, you know, not potentially live in one of the biggest energy generating areas with brownouts. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll now, now move to uh, government questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks to all the witnesses for coming. We've heard extensive evidence in the last couple of days of the hearing about the regulatory framework on energy effectively requiring uh, transmission operators to choose uh, the cheapest possible option. That's a bit of a generalisation. Uh, but a regulatory structure that, uh, that does not allow them, in effect, to take into account a range of social harms and costs. And in the context of the potential uh, undergrounding of the Humelink project, we even had a man with great expertise in transmission, uh, except uh, that the regulator would not have approved undergrounding of Humelink, and he's very much in favour of undergrounding. So I'm just curious to ask of the two mayors, what's your view on a regulatory framework that seems to be premised um, on the cheapest possible options and not taking into account a range of other social and community harms and costs? 
Um, and secondly, um, is that an issue in terms of reform of the national energy framework uh, that you might take up in your local government advocacy role? Um, I guess small communities, if you live in there, they're, a bit, they're, they're different to probably large communities. You know, I mean, if you're putting a, a highway through Western Sydney, um, you know, it, it has its effects, but in a small community, it tears the community apart. What's going on here? You know, we've got families that aren't talking anymore, and, and historically that's happened with these sorts of projects too. So I think a view of the, of the social side is not being looked at. Um, our community will never be the same again now. Even if all this is scrapped now, the damage that it's done, we don't have a project or a win or a, um, a transmission line in our community that, that, that our community is torn apart. Um, some of those will never heal. So I don't think there is enough put into it and the conversation around amortising this stuff over 100 years, you know, doesn't seem to come into it. It is a purely a cost thing and it's, uh, it's a cost to a dollar to the, um, to the companies but it's a cost of our community to our community. Thanks, Mr. Maybe just to build on uh, what Councillor Noakes said, I, I, I think if you are going for the lowest cost and that is above ground, come out and be honest with it and charge ahead, you're effectively going to be doing, um, you're effectively going to be doing compulsory acquisition. So cut the dance. I think we need, um, we, we, we need certainty. Yep. You're, not going to, you're not going to buy social licence through discussion. And if I could just add one more thing to that, I'm not a council for a long time, I've only got seven years experience, but one thing I've learned, every time we have tried to do a project, Quickly and cheaply, it's ended badly. So there was a representative, um, a general manager in fact, from a regional council who spoke to us yesterday and said that a comparative lack of expertise in this complex issue of transmission has been a real problem for his council. And I put that to him, or he gave that evidence in the context of some discussion that we were having about barriers for community groups and individuals engaging with transcript. And I'm just uh, curious, maybe, uh, from you, Kate, uh, given that you've raised it as well, if uh, you see a role for some form of entity or organisation with relevant expertise in these complex issues to play some sort of independent ombudsman type role in relation to the rollout of what are obviously huge projects that have a massive effect um, on regional communities. Yeah, thank you. Certainly, um, some sort of independence or an ombudsman certainly would, I think, be valued. Um, perhaps another option that would be even more um, valued by the local community would be the funding to embed appropriate experts in, you know, at least one of our councils within the region, that, but working across the whole co-rem. Um, um, from my experience, is a big difference when someone's got the badge on. Thank you. Can I just yeah. put a little bit in there? And, and as I think you're probably aware, after all the everything we've been in through the last few years, we haven't got money flowing out of our pockets, and we're very, very short on staff yeah. of all councils. <laughs> and we're, we're we're really battling to keep our heads above ground. And and this certainly isn't 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 putting putting staff on jobs that they shouldn't be doing is not a preference for us. That's for sure. Certainly. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Um, just, I suppose, acknowledging that this inquiry has largely been um, based, well, is set up to in inquire into the feasibility of undergrounding um, these transmission lines connected to renewable energy projects. Um, I, I just wanted to um, get your thoughts on, on the consultation process um, so far um, and any uh, comments you might, something we've heard about extensively over the last 24 hours about the consultation and um, what your thoughts would be on um, suggested improvements um, as a way forward or anything else? Can I just start with that? Communication in this is, is, is the big thing, I, I believe, and it's a money-saving process we can do. If we have proper communications with this, it can fast-track things a lot quicker than, than, than coming up against brick walls all the time. So if there's honesty through, through the two parties, I believe, and that is, Proper communication between the group for a start and, and trust will, uh, we can get to a lot, the, 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 the nitty gritty a lot quicker 
than beating around the bush, I, I believe. Um, I think uh, the trouble is, is when there's a void, and there's been a void so even in the transmission lines for a few years, we know it's been coming, there's been a void of information and that void is then always filled with, with rumour and innuendo and that's been our problem. Um, the consultation, even in little bits when they didn't know where it was going, should have happened earlier. It's too late when it comes to us as a big map with a big grey line on it and saying this is where it's going. And, and it, originally it's really hard to pick even where that line is going if you own a house near it. So, so like all these projects, a consultation period is far too late. And um, if, if you don't mind me asking, when, when has this consultation um, commenced with um, your particular shire? Um, we came to a meeting here, I would say, in or May, and that was the first we saw of maps that actually had the, the Hunter Link or whatever they're calling it on it. So that was when we first knew that it was going to, one leg was going to come into Walker, where it was going to run. Because I guess the assumption was always there that it would follow the current path, but it hasn't So in a lot of areas. So there's a lot of people that have, uh, you know, haven't realised it was coming and didn't realise till they walked into a town hall or a community <coughs> hall somewhere and saw a map and, um, you know, they, they think, well, there's a one common wide path through my place, no consultation, what can I do? And then they turn to council and, I mean, we're, we would love to help, but uh, we're as uh, not useless but uh, uninformed as they are. And how long has the res been, um, you, you mentioned it's been sort of, was it, was it five years? that's been in progress? Or? The, the res, I think, um, was gazetted about two years ago. Um, in late 2020, um, more just because of the significant projects, <coughs> state significant projects that were starting, um, your Shire Council actually uh, passed a motion to host a joint forum, which we did with our colleagues here and a couple of other councils, and we did get some participation from the state government. Um, so uh, that was before there was a terms of reference for the res or anything like that, and that sort of, I guess, along with uh, Mayor Noakes and then subsequently Mayor Copeland's efforts sort of started us on that journey. So we have done our best to try, try to stay ahead of things that we could see were coming at us, um, but largely but, yeah, each step of the way we have been feeling a lack of information, and certainly in regard to the transmission lines specifically, it's really only been the information available in the last couple of months. And as I've mentioned earlier, our councillors have got a very balanced role to play. So we've been very careful to send people to the source of truth because we are not experts in this area. And it's got to remember the res that came to us in 2020 started in 2015. So it was, you know, five years. Sorry. Yeah, right. That's, that was five years before. And I remember talking to a girl in the department who said, I can't wait for this meeting because it's been five years in the making. And I just said, well, the pity hadn't told us at some stage that this was coming. Look, um, we really, I think that's pretty much the conclusion for my, for my time for questions. So I thank you all uh, for coming to the hearing today. Um, committee members may have additional questions for you after the hearing and the, the committee has resolved that answers to these along with, any question, uh, along with any answers to questions taken on notice today are returned to us within seven days. The Secretariat will contact you in relation to any of these questions. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, thanks. No Either an oath or an affirmation, please. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Jason McKellar. I'm uh, an assistant commissioner with the New South Wales Rural Fire Service. 
Uh, my role is Director of Operations for the Northern Half of the State. Uh, the affirmation I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Would you like to start by making a short statement? Keep to no more than a couple of minutes. No, look, I, obviously I'm here on behalf of the New South Wales Royal Fire Service um, mm -hmm. for the understanding to uh, answer questions uh, predominantly about uh, firefighting tactics and strategies uh, within and around um, our power Thank you. Thank you. I'll um, move straight to questions. Okay. Over to the opposition. Thank you. I'll just ask that, um, one question and thank you for, for coming today. Um, I'm not sure if you got to, if you were able to listen to RN breakfast this morning. Um, so do you think the recent uh, public commentary on the cost of undergrounding for example, comments from the uh, Australian Energy Market Operator CEO Daniel Westerman, <coughs> excuse me, on ABC RN Breakfast this morning, takes into account the cost of rebuilding after disasters such as, say, in 2018, the Tathra bushfire, where evidence was given to the colonial inquest that the fire may have been started by power lines coming into contact with vegetation? No, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the, um, the RN breakfast. Um, I'm happy to take it on notice and have a listen and, um, and come back to you if you like. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much for appearing today. Um, so we've heard a lot about um, the way in which um, firefighting assets will be used in and around um, power lines and some yeah. of the issues that um, I guess are presented when we are facing a fire that is um, either on the other side of the power line or um, approaching a power line and, and the difficulties uh, around fighting those fires. Um, in relation to something like a 330 KVA tower um, or, you know, some of the ones that we're looking at in, um, with HumeLink, for example, which are the 500 KVA towers, 75 metres. Um, there's been a lot of um, discussion around how the energy companies will um, disable the line in order to provide um, safety for firefighters um, and the assets around them to fight those fires. Could you explain to us what the process is in relation to requesting confirming and then re-energising those power lines in the event of a fire? Yeah, I think from our perspective, um, if there is a fire in and around a power line, particularly a high voltage power line, um, our, obviously our number one mm. priority is the safety of our firefighters on the ground. Um, and we'll make an assessment of, you know, how close do we need to get to the power lines to to, uh, to try and combat the fire. Um, and if the answer to that is, you know, we, we need to get very close, we would uh, go back to our control room, um, uh, yeah, our control room, and they would make contact with the relevant authority and ask that those, um, those lines be isolated. Uh, and then that would be up to the, uh, the authority. I'm not sure on exactly how long that takes or the exact procedure, but that would be the request. Uh, and when we got advice back um, from that power company that they were in fact isolated, we would um, give our troops the okay to, uh, to work in and around that area. Have you had uh, cause to actually request uh, a um, uh, shutdown of a of a power line for a um, for a fire incident. Yes, I have. And have you ever had um, that request denied? Um, not in my experience. Um, no, I couldn't quote a time where I haven't. Uh, and that that would extend to uh, rail corridors as well as power corridors. Um, but usually they will uh, they will work within us. We, um, we obviously have a relationship with all landholders uh, in, the, uh, in the rural fire area uh, and we meet with them regularly through our bushfire management committees and we would uh, um, alter, uh, 
discuss the, these sorts of uh, processes uh, before a fire actually happens. So um, the, our local district managers, who are also the uh, executive officers of our bushfire management committees, would have an understanding of how that works, who mm -hmm. to contact, those sorts of things. Yesterday we had uh, raised with us um, concerns that, um, for example, where there are large um, uh, transmission lines like the 330 KVA uh, transmission lines in and around the Tumid area, um, that during the uh, Black Summer bushfires, the 1920, 19, uh, sorry, 2019-2020 uh, fires that we had, uh, particularly around the Duns Road fire, sure. that there, um, there appeared to be a reluctance to de-energise some of the lines. Okay. Do you, can you um, provide uh, some feedback on if you've been made aware of those sort of situations happening before? Because it seemed, it seemed a very um, uh, unusual circumstance to us that an energy company might um, put the supply of power, even if it is to a large um, population base, ahead of safety of on the ground communities. Um, so I'm just, I guess I'm just trying to get my head around if you know if it may have happened and in what circumstances that might occur. Sure. During the, um, the, the Duns Road fire, I was actually working in the northern half of the state, so I don't know the exact example. Yep. Um, but look, I, I, I have no doubt there was probably a, a discussion, mm -hmm. but it would be brief. And I would assume that it would be they would follow the advice of the um, the fire services yep. uh, and the incident management team that was working down there to uh, to isolate those lines as quickly as they could. Okay, when you're working with aerial assets to um, try and suppress fires, um, and you are presented with um, those large um, high voltage power lines, can you provide a little bit of insight as to what restrictions they might? Um, uh, place on um, uh, those aerial assets being deployed, um, you know, for example, helicopters or even like a large 737 tanker, anything in between, yes. um, what, what considerations are required um, to, to be put in place because of those power lines that you wouldn't not, not necessarily have uh, in, in flat country? Yeah. Um, Obviously, the um, the larger power lines are a uh, are an obstruction. They're a um, but they as are other towers, transmission towers and whatnot. Um, when our uh, aerial assets are at work, the um, the pilot in command is is the person in charge, and they have the final say. Um, we would form, I guess, an air group, and it'd be. We would have an air attack supervisor, which is a, a, a fire person, a person with fire qualifications. Uh, and they would take a lead role in um, finding obstacles, uh, advising the rest of the aircraft working in that area, and they would take on a... Um, the role of an air attack supervisor is somewhat of a, a controlling effect over the fire, so they would be talking to all the aerial assets there, they would make them aware of the, um, the obstruction, whatever it may be, and they would amend strategies to um, to compensate for those, um, they're certainly not going to um, take uh, take a high level of risk and fly close to them. Uh, they will amend their strategy uh, and work around the obstruction. With um, uh, the visibility aspects and um, the difficulties posed by. Um, smoke, dust, um, and the like. Do do you find that there is a a larger reluctance to um, to tackle uh, fires with um, with aerial assets um, around those lines, or is it um, is it something that that is just accepted? Um, has has it been a a handbrake on um, a deployment of an asset? At, at any stage in your experience? I, I would say not the actual deployment. I would say when we would deploy a, an aerial asset to a fire. Um, fires can cover a large, a large area, um, but it would be a problem um, if the fire was um, directly adjacent to 
uh, whatever the structure was, mm. um, in low visibility, whether it's smoke, dust, rain, whatever the case may be, um, again, the, the pilot would have the ultimate say. The air attack supervisor would be advising all the pilots in the area. Um, and we also have access, obviously, to, um, to weather radar, to the Bureau of Meteorology, to all of those sorts of things. So we have a lot of information coming in. But where there is a concern for visibility, um, we would cease operation in that area. In relation to the different way you would tackle perhaps a fire that is uh, emerging near an underground um, power line as opposed to an overhead power line, uh, do you imagine that it would be a, a different scenario? Do you imagine that underground um, uh, power assets would be an easier um, uh, easier infrastructure to defend um, and also do you think that in your experience the overhead assets are more likely to perhaps um, cause uh, be the cause of fire through um, arcing etc um, have you experienced that? Do you think that that would change the way that you would approach a fire um, that was perhaps in the vicinity of an underground? Yeah. Um, for, I guess, firstly, obviously, there is um, instances of, um, of power lines um, creating fire. Um, and I think, um, you know, we can provide pretty accurate statistics on those sorts of things for you. Um, the first part of the question, sorry, was... Oh, the difference in what, sorry, the way yes. you would, yeah, tackle... The, um, obviously, um, in an initial attack of a fire, whether it's ground or air, um, you are going to... You are going to see the obstacle being the, uh, the staunchion or the power line, uh, whereas underground, uh, I would think people, if, obviously, if the, the power line is buried, um, it would just be like any other... Portion of bush. I, I assume there's an easement, as there would be an easement. Um, so we would be able to identify it, but it would be less restrictive, obviously, for particularly aircraft. Um, I, I suppose for from ground-based firefighting in vehicles or on foot, um, we have a large network of fire trails across the state that we, that we invest pretty heavily in, um, and most power lines have or all power lines, I assume, have a, uh, an easement beneath them, uh, which could, could not always, but could form part of that uh, network. So, just in the minute I think I've got left, um, would it be fair? Would it be a fair summary for me to suggest that overhead power lines potentially can cause uh, fires through arcing in extreme weather? Um, that the overhead power lines provide some restrictions um, and some some extra considerations required to to fighting fires in and around them and that perhaps undergrounding the asset might make it less restrictive and slightly easier in planning and execution of fighting fire than um, the over overhead power line situations. I think yes, we, w we would have to understand from a firefighting perspective what infrastructure goes into undergrounding, um, whether I think there's kiosks or whatever they refer to uh, at, at certain points, um, the easements that are available. Um, on the, it is acknowledged that, um, that, that power lines have certainly started fires in the past, however, the the vast majority of fires in a season like 1920 were caused by <coughs> which were lightning strikes. Mm. Um, so again, there are uh, accurate st statistics available that we, we can provide if you need those. Mm. I'd say my time is pretty much expired. Yep. Thank yep. you very much for, for <laughs> providing some insight now to Now move you. to um, cross bench questions. Thanks, oh, Kate. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to take you to uh, some of the by Transgrid last week in relation to fires. We were asking about, uh, there's been quite a lot of discussion on this committee about the risk um, of uh, overhead transmission lines uh, with fire and the, yes, the limitations it, it can um, 
uh, cause in terms of fighting those fires. So Transgrid uh, gave evidence, Mr Brett Redman, saying that in Australia, for example, we can't find any instance of a bushfire started by any transmission <coughs> line more than 66 kV. So we are talking about a 100 kV line. Uh, is that your experience? Um, Some, a lot of the lines around here would be 330 kV. Yeah, I would have to do, I would have to have my team do some research on that. Um, I, we, uh, we looked at some statistics, but it wasn't the, the actual mm. voltage of the, the lines, but um, there, there's certainly coronial reports and, and whatnot that talk about um, known fires that were caused by, um, by power lines. Uh, but I'd have to refer back to those to see what the actual um, the size or capacity of those were. Yeah, that would that would be useful. Uh, sorry to give you some homework, uh, but it's it, it, it's critical um, evidence, I think. And how do power lines start fires? Uh, broadly speaking, um, uh, there, there's examples there where uh, in high wind type scenario, um, uh, part of a tree or branch or a, a bow would fall across a power line, damage a conductor, they would fall to the ground, ignite the vegetation. Um, there's, there, I think there's examples too of power lines in a high wind scenario that would come together. Uh, we heard about I know that. the authorities have over recent, or quite some time, have uh, put considerable effort into putting spaces on lines so that power lines can't touch. Um, they also have requirement under um, <coughs> under uh, the bushfire management committees and whatnot to maintain the easements underneath the power lines, so that they are um, maintained. So there's not an abundance of fuel there. They're trimmed, um, so so trees don't come in contact with them. Um, and then that's obviously high power um, lines that run through wilderness type areas. Um, but we also have um, power lines everywhere. Um, and you, you will know if you drive down the street, you will see um, trees that are trimmed around power lines uh, for the same sort of principle. And we've heard a lot in this committee about transmission lines arcing. We've heard from people who are part of their uh, rural fire brigades uh, to, uh, saying that they've witnessed that, this yep. is particularly intimate in terms of the Duns Road fire. Yep. What is that? Uh, transmission line arcing, what does that mean? I think that's a, a broad term for um, something that's come in contact with it, whether it is uh, vegetation, it is debris that's flown into it. Uh, I think in a lot of these scenarios it is, um, obviously it's high wind, there is a lot of debris around. Uh, it can also be in a very smoky environment uh, when there's lots of particulate matter in the air that um, the electricity actually can arc through um, through that sort of atmosphere to the ground. Uh, and I suppose the other one would be uh, wildlife animals, birds. Yeah. And what's your view then in terms of the overall... Uh, uh, the overall um, wisdom of uh, putting in place uh, a lot of overhead transmission lines in a, a, a regional area such as this, uh, given what I'm sure you're aware of in terms of the increased risk of uh, greater numbers of more severe fires in the coming decades. As a firefighter, what is your view as to the wisdom of putting in place these overhead transmission lines and do you, are you advocating for those to go underground? Uh, I'm certainly in my position and role, I'm not advocating. I, um, I certainly would offer that um, some of the fires that we, we, we combat start in the most remote areas um, and burn into uh, urban areas such as the, the Tarthra fire was an example that was mentioned. Um, I, th I think if, I think it's quite obvious if there was some, if power was put underground, it does reduce that, that risk. It, it reduces a, um, an obstructional risk, but I, I'm certainly not educated enough in the, the 
in the subject matter to talk about the, the benefits from a, a power point of view uh, and how that would work or a cost effectiveness. <coughs> Can I also ask about access to water in um, our firefighting, uh, d days of firefighting? So uh, we've also heard about um, the, some of the transmission lines being proposed, these big massive new transmission lines will be cutting across and um, uh, interfering with uh, the ability to access some of the water that's used in emergencies, in dams and what have you. Yep. Uh, how much, how important is that in terms of being able to access that and have you, do you, do you see that as potentially something to also uh, consider? Because it will limit the ability for firefighting, uh, for aerial firefighting to be able to access that uh, water. I, I would go back to the, um, the, the earlier answer that any line or, or, or staunch and tower, we would treat as an obstruction, um, particularly for our aircraft. If um, yes, if a power line was strung across a a dam or a river or a, whatever the water course is, um, we would avoid it. Um, so, but or near to it, I, I assume or, as yeah, well. We're certainly not going to go. Um, we're not going to place uh, our aircraft or, or, or people at risk to, to, to sneak in or get close. So if there's a power line um, that would affect the operation of the aircraft, we would certainly avoid it and find a, a another water source. Uh, obviously, um, we're, in, we're in Australia, there's not an abundance of water sources everywhere, um, but that, that is part of the process, particularly for um, for aerial operations that they need to find a suitable water source, but for also for our vehicles on the ground that have a water tank on board, they um, once they uh, exhaust that water, they have to find another source to top up. Now, a, a, a fire truck can pull up to a dam and, and drop a pump in it and, and fill the tank, um, and they're, they're, depending on what the power line is that's above them, Again, they would choose. They would have to make a risk assessment on the day uh, at the specific location to whether they would do that or not. Uh, thank you. So, has uh, is the RFS consulted uh, when it comes to the location of transmission lines? Um, I would have to take that on note. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Chair. That's my questions done. Thank you, Ms. We'll now move to uh, Mr. Lawrence. Uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks for coming along, Mr. McKellar. Um, are you able to give us any specific examples by reference to your experience and expertise where high voltage transmission lines have interfered in fighting a fire and where that's had a significant uh, impact on the impact of the fire? Look, I, I, I think. In recent times, we've already spoken about the Tartha example. Um, there was, I, I, in my time, um, I did come through the aviation side, so I did a lot of flying. There was numerous times where um, I would amend a strategy based on where a power line was strung. Yep. Uh, and that was just, um, yeah, from a risk point of view, I was not going to fly our helicopter or our aeroplane under, over, or, or sorry, not over, but in the vicinity of, of a power line, particularly when there is um, a, a visibility issue, because, it, I mean, I, th I think to set the scene a little bit, they're not flying on a clear, beautiful summer's day. Uh, it's usually, um, you know, there's smoke, around. smoke, dust, <laughs> it's usually windy. Um, so our, we're, not, we're certainly not uh, risk adverse, but we're very careful in yeah. what we do. Um, so yes, sorry, to the question, yes, I have had times uh, in my career where I've had to amend an astrat a strategy because of uh, a power line. Um, and that's included circumstances, has it, where the fire has materially worsened because you couldn't adopt a strategy that but for the transmission line you would have? No, I couldn't give you an example of a time where I think a fire is actually... Um, escaped beyond a, a smaller area where, or where we've had to fall back to another containment line. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd have to go back and look at records, but I, 
I, I couldn't give you an example of one that's absolutely got away. It may have extended a little bit in a, from a safety point of view is that I'll fall back to the next road as my containment line, um, but I, I couldn't give you an example of one that's actually got away and sure. done um, I'm going to ask you um, a question now that uh, is quite general, so okay. if it's not possible to answer, I'm sure you'll tell me. Um, in your opinion, and expertise, will the installation above ground of these quite lengthy high voltage transmission lines like uh, Hume Link and New England Link lead to more bushfires? Yeah, I, I couldn't say that, no. Um, it would, they would, no, I couldn't say that. I mean, there, there's so many variables to that question. Uh, I mean, you know, an easement creates an access. More people could get in there. Um, that could cause any number of fires. Um, so, no, I couldn't give any. Um, are you able to say whether the installation above ground of lengthy uh, high voltage transmission lines like Hume Link and New England Link will mean that fires that will happen will be worse over a certain forward period? No, I don't think so. Look, I think if we go back to your original question, um, just to clarify, from my perspective as a fire manager, I would look at the area and that the fact that there is more power lines in there, there's more stanchions, there's more infrastructure, um, that would be a consideration um, to the risk levels in there. Now, that might work both ways. Mm. We may well use the access trails as part of our fire trail network or as a fire break. Um, but just by virtue, I think, um, obviously, that having infrastructure out there, um, it would come into the, the, the risk equation of what we would do to mitigate a fire, and it would also pose some limitations to how we would do that. Um, Thanks, Mr. McCullough. I think so. My questions, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. McKellar, for your time today. Thank you. Um, are you able to um, uh, remark briefly on uh, the, uh, I'll go back to consultation again? It's been a key theme throughout um, our hearing and, and the evidence yesterday and again today um, about the consultation that occurs through um, you know, major projects such as this. Um, and I understand that you know perhaps. Um, and you've already taken on notice a, a, a question from Ms. Fearman about that. But if you could just speaking more generally about, about any of these, yeah, and, and, and these significant projects, and um, from a from a very very broad perspective, um, the RFS is about 75,000 members, and we affect a lot more people than that. And in my experience, you consult, you consult, you consult some more, and when you think you've done enough, you go back and engage some more, um, and. And, and I, and I speak, if I can use an example, a project I've been working on the last couple of years is um, uh, better levels of engagement with our, um, with our farming communities. Um, I remember sitting in this very room, actually, on the stage doing a town hall, and um, it got to a point where it wasn't that great, but we've worked on it and worked on it and worked on it, and a couple of years later, we're, we're making some really good inroads and we're, we're working pretty tightly with New South Wales farmers and landholders across the place, but it takes a lot of work and you have to um, continually consult. Um, and like I said, when you think you've done enough, do a bit more. Thank you. In terms of the, um, uh, you commented on the, the easements um, and, and, and the, the, I suppose the fact that there is um, somewhat of an opportunity there. Um, are you aware of uh, whether that opportunity would exist similarly with the undergrounding I, of look, transmission infrastructure? Just on a brief, I had a, a, a quick read um, of some of that tried to get a broad cross section. I understand that the, um, the easements for undergrounded power would still be there, but they would be a, a, a smaller width as opposed to the, um, the high voltage power lines, which can be up to a couple of hundred metres wide. Um, we, we, we maintain a lot of uh, asset protection zones around infrastructure, around urban interface, uh, and we would look at, you know, anything that's, you know, 20 or 30 metres wide, uh, we would use as, um, as a, uh, a protection zone or 
to our advantage in firefighting. Uh, and if you look around most urban areas of New South Wales now that interface with the bush, you'll see that there's an asset protection zone behind the buildings, and that is a buffer zone that we maintain, or the landholder maintains, where firefighters can get in there, gain a uh, gain opportunity in a, in a safe, cleared area to combat the fire that's coming through the bush. Um, a power line easement without a power line over the top would be, I guess, something that we, we, we would certainly factor into our, uh, our networks uh, and utilise. And how big of a role, I suppose, does the size of the easement play in terms of establishing that, um, that it, fire break or one of a better It crisis? very much depends on um, the, the, the type of vegetation that the fire would be burning through, okay. um, how thick it is, what is the run between <clears throat> from, excuse me, from the, the previous break um, and the fuel levels on the ground. But, um, yeah, around uh, urban areas, we'll, we'll, I think an average is probably about 30 metres. Do you have any other no, questions? Uh, thank you very much uh, for attending the hearing today. Um, committee members may have additional questions for you after the hearing, um, and the committee has resolved that the answers to these, along with any answers to questions you took on notice today, um, be returned within seven days. Our, our secretariat will contact you in relation to these no questions. Thank, thank you very you much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.